7, if you would. Micah chapter number 7. Let's all stand and we'll get right into it here uh, this evening. Micah chapter number 7. Uh, this is le- sermon number 8 in the book of Micah. It's, it's kind of a, I, I know that we've taken uh, a week off with uh, Brother Locke. Uh, but uh, just but it's kind of interesting on how long the Lord has allowed us to go through the book of Micah. So Micah chapter number seven, uh, begin reading in verse number one. We're just going to read the first seven verses. Okay, so Micah chapter seven, verse number one. The Bible says, "Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat." My soul desired the first, the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. That they may do evil with both hands, earnestly the prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desires, so they wrap it up. Verse number 4, chapter 7 of Micah. The best of them is as a briar, the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh, now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Verse 7. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Tonight's message is titled this, When Alone, Keep Your Focus. When Alone, Keep Your Focus. Let's pray and then you can be seated. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and goodness. Lord, I ask you, Father, that you would just help us now, Lord, to, to, to hone in and to focus, dear Lord, as to what your word has to say. Lord, I pray that you would just help us, Lord, to... Uh, have the strength, Lord, from uh, a busy day, Lord. No doubt many of your people work today. Many of your people have got up early and they're they're physically and perhaps maybe mentally drained. But Lord, I pray that you help us to focus here on your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Have you ever undergone an uh, evaluation before? An evaluation? You go to the doctor's office, what are they doing? They're evaluating you. They're evaluating your height, they're evaluating your weight, they're evaluating your blood pressure, they're evaluating all these different things about you, and then at the end of their evaluation, they give you a consensus of your health. Sometimes it's good news, sometimes it could be better news. Uh, Sometimes we we hope and pray that we never receive bad news when we go to the doctor's office, for sure. Uh, How about this? Um, Maybe for your job, you received an evaluation. You may have received an evaluation for based on the performance of your work. They're, they're seeing where you're weak at or where your strengths are at or those types of things. To evaluate, this is the definition of it, to judge the value or worth of someone or something. An example of evaluate is when a teacher reviews a paper in order to give a grade. Now, I'm pretty sure we all know what that is. You know, the past seven weeks, we've been going through the book of Micah, and it's like as though God is given an evaluation of his people. Now, I'm pretty sure that if God were to give a letter grade to his people, we all would know what it would be based on the past uh, six chapters here, past seven weeks. Now, in chapter number seven, Micah, he's voicing his opinion now about the people. And his opinion is, it's like he agrees with the Lord here, and he gives his honest review of the people of Israel, and Micah gives an expression of hopelessness about the people here. And look at verse number one there. Have your Bibles open, and let's tune in there. Verse one says, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as grape gleanings of the vintage. There was no cluster to eat. My soul desirous the first ripe fruit. Now, Israel is often compared to as a vineyard, okay? And Micah is saying this, hey, my soul desires to see fresh fruit in Israel. Now, he's not literally referring to grapes. He's not literally referring to say, boy, when I go through Israel, I want to see a bunch of grapes. No, that's not what he's referring to. What he's referring to is that he wants to see people who are upright. He wants to see, well, how about this? As it talks about in chapter 6, verse 8, 
He's looking for people who do justly. He's looking for people who love mercy. He's looking for people who walk humbly with the Lord their God. That's what he's looking for. And he describes Israel as a vineyard, and he's looking for all the good fruit. But the problem is this. The more he looks, there's a shortage of fruit. There's a shortage of good fruit. Well, can I say it this way? There was no good men left. How discouraging that would be. I mean, throughout all the land of Israel, Micah's looking, and there's no good men left at all. Look at verse 2. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. Now, look at the word, uh, the good man, a good man. And good just doesn't mean, oh, yeah, that was good. You know, we, we go to our restaurant, we say, what's your overall opinion of the food? Well, it was good. Okay, this word good, it means this. It means faithful. It means kind. It means godly. That's what that word good means. He says, the good man is perish. Hey, Micah, he's he's searching diligently for a man who is faithful. Now, now let me have your attention up here. I I know you're tired. He's, He's going throughout Israel, and he's looking for a man who is faithful. He's looking for a man who is kind. He's looking for a man who is godly. But there was, let me say it this way, there was a shortage of godly men. There was a shortage of faithful men. There was a shortage of good men. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, something that we need today more than ever in this generation is good men. Definitely, we certainly do. Uh, I mean, we need men who are faithful. We need men who are kind We need men who are godly. Hey, we need men who are faithful, faithful to to their churches, faithful to their homes, faithful uh, faithful more than anything, faithful to their relationship with God. Hey, hey, there's, listen, man's greatest need, I'm talking men, masculinity here, men's greatest need is not a new pickup truck. Men's greatest need is not a new shotgun, as fun as they may be, it's not men's greatest needs. Hey, men's greatest needs is not for their sports team to win the championship game. Think of it this way. A year from now, it won't even matter that they won that championship game. It won't matter. Hey, but what men's greatest needs are is that men will have a faithful relationship with God Almighty. That is what men's uh, greatest needs are. I mean, obviously salvation. But hey, boy, boy, I'm thankful for the men's retreat that we went to, though. I really am thankful for that because this is what it did. It's like for, for the men who are here that were able to go to it, I, I, I mean, I'm looking at Brother Tam here. Brother Tam, it was like a shot in the arm for us, wasn't it? It was a shot in the arm for us to do this. Continue to stay faithful. Continue to stay faithful to church. Continue to stay faithful to God. Continue to stay faithful to the men of God. Continue to to just stay faithful. Hey, listen to this, church men. Hey, if you're faithful to God, then you're going to be faithful in other areas of your life as well. Hey, when you're faithful to God, then you're going to be, it's going to help you to be faithful to your spouse. When you're faithful to God, it's going to help you to be faithful uh, to your church. When you're faithful to God, it's going to help you to be faithful in your other relationships that you have with your kids and with your grandkids. It's going to be helping you to be faithful in all the different relationships, including your peers and your coworkers and, and those that are, you're around on a regular basis. Hey, this is amazing. You have a faithful relationship with God, and it kind of impacts, well, every area of your life. And what we need today in this generation more than ever are good men. Men who are faithful, but also not just men who are faithful, but men who are kind. Kind men. Hey, hey, listen, church. Listen, listen, listen. Don't, think, don't, don't get this confused. Kindness is not weakness. It's not weakness. Being kind does not mean you're a pushover. Being kind does not mean people s- step all over you and walk all over you and you take advantage of them. No, no, no. That's not being kind. Hey, the the greatest example of masculinity isn't having big, strong muscles, isn't going out hunting, isn't driving fast cars. No, the perfect example of a man is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect man. He's a man's man. And I'm so thankful that he was kind. He was kind. Hey, he was bold too. He was bold. 
hey, when, we, when he saw that the house of prayer was being turned into a den of thieves, boy, he was bold, wasn't he? He went over, he flipped over money changers' tables, and he grabbed whips, he started whipping them, started chasing them. You know, when I get to heaven, I want to see that on the, on the big screen that they're going to show everything. I want to see that. Hey, our Lord was bold, but I'm so thankful that he's kind. Hey, men, our Lord is gentle. He's a, put it this way, a gentle man. A gentleman. Hey, I know sometimes we as men, we say, oh, suck it up, buttercup, be tough. Right? I mean, I'm guilty of that. Be strong, be tough. Hey, but sometimes probably the most masculine thing that we can do is mimic our Savior and just be kind. Just be kind. Have gentle hands and loving hands and be kind. Here's, a, here's Micah. He's looking throughout all the land of Israel. He's looking for good men. Can't find none. There's, there's no faithful men. There's no men who are faithful. There's no men who are kind. There's no men who are godly. Hey, men, if we just strive to be godly, I think that'll help us be faithful and kind. Yeah. Micah, he could find nothing. He could find no one. Now, <clears throat> as we continue to look at our passage, look at verse number three, if you would. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse number two. And there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Their hunt, or they, they hunt every man his brother with a net. Hey, listen. When there is an absence of good men, there will be an uprise of wicked men. Did you hear that? Hey, I, I want the good men to listen to this. When there was an absence of good men, there was going to be an uprise of wicked men. And wicked men was all that there was left in Israel at the time. I mean, these men had little regard for the well-being of their neighbors. These men had little regard. I mean, they were waiting for opportunity to shed blood, is what we get from verse number 2. And, and that these were just the common men. These were just the common people of the day. Hey, they, they were just weren't the wicked ones as well, but also men of position. They were also wicked. Look at verse 3 that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward. And a great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. Micah is saying that the princes and the judges, they would ask for a reward. Well, well, what does that mean? Hey, the princes and judges, they were in positions of making decisions. They were in positions of authority. And this is what they're doing. They're asking and they're seeking for reward. Well, what does that mean? Well, since they're the ones who make the decisions, they're saying this. Hey, you give me a reward and I'll decide something in your favor. Uh, that's called bribery. <laughs> and that was wicked. And then it goes on to say, uh, uh, the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire. Well, the great man, hey, when the Bible talks about the great man here, he's not talking about great in regards to morals. He's not talking about great in regards to standards. Great here is being reverence to his position, a great position. Hey, listen, you can, a man can be in a great position, but still not be a great man. And, the, and this, the, the, a great man here, he was, uh, he's asking oh, for mischievous desires. He uttereth his mischievous desires. Well, what does that mean? It means he desires things that will eventually lead him to destruction. Hey, hey, church, hey, hey, I'm gonna, and let me speak to the men here for a little bit. Hey, hey, men, there are so many men today that desire mischievous things. They desire things that, now listen, that are going to lead them to destruction. There are men who desire mischievous things. There are men who desire alcohol. There are, things that, there are men that desire drugs. There are men that desire pornography. There are men that, that, that desire things that they place in their bodies. Hey, look up here. There are things that men place in their bodies, and it will ultimately lead to destruction. Hey, those are mischievous things. Don't have those desires, men yeah. and ladies. Micah describes them as being briars and thorns in verse number 4. Hey, the only thing that's good for briars and thorns is this, burning. Really, that's really it. Now, with that thought in mind, that the only thing that is good for briars and thorns, look at verse number four and keep that thought in your mind. It says, 
The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchmen and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Back in Bible days, they would, they would build towers, and at the top of the tower, they would have a watchman. And what the watchman would do is, well, you guessed it, watch. Very difficult, on it, I know. They would watch. And as they would watch, they're making sure that is, is anything hostile coming their way? Is there anything that's going to, is anything going to hurt them? Anything, any invaders going to come? And what we see here is that the watchmen, they're often pictured as the prophets of God because the prophets that they would say this, hey, there is judgment coming. Judgment is on its way, watchmen. And when the Bible mentions the, the term visitation, it's talking about the judgment is actually arrived. That's why we change visitation to outreach in the announcements. <laughs> the judgment has come. No. <laughs> so basically what Micah is saying this, the best of those men, they're as good as briars and thorns. And they're going to face a judgment that will leave them perplexed. They ignored the prophets. They ignored the watchmen. And now the visitation is here. Now the judgment is here, and they're going to be perplexed. That means they're going to be confused. Hey, when this judgment comes, they're going to be, they're going to have this mindset. How did this happen? How did this happen? We, we were doing so well. We were doing so great. How in the world did this happen? Hey, it's obvious when, that, when there is no good men amongst God's people, we can conclude, now listen, God's people are no longer reliable. When there's no more good men amongst God's people, God's people are no longer reliable. Notice that even the closest of relationships are not reliable when there's no good men. Look at verse number five. Look what Micah says. He says, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Hey, it's like because of the rampant sin and selfishness, uh, personal relationships are going to begin to dissolve. Uh, Micah, gave, Micah gave some pretty practical advice here. He says, if a friend is like actively involved in sin, don't put your trust in that friend. Come on, church. That's pretty, that's pretty practical there. Hey, if, if you're struggling with a particular sin and you know of somebody who is struggling with the same sin, you sh probably shouldn't be going to them for counsel. That's what Micah is saying. No, no, no. That's what God is saying. That's what his word is saying. If you are struggling with something, and I am struggling with something, I'm probably not your best source of help <laughs> if we're struggling with the same thing. And, and, and that's what Micah is saying there. And, and then uh, the people there were so corrupt that even family relationships could not be trusted. Look at verse number six. Listen, for the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Hey, listen, where there is no good godly men, even the closest relationships will be torn apart. Hey, you might think you have a tight family, but when sin creeps in, it'll rip your family from the inside out. It'll destroy relationships. It'll turn son against father. It'll turn against daughter against mother. It will turn uh, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, the Bible says. And the Bible says a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Hey, hey, godly men, don't allow sin to creep into your home because sin will destroy your family from the inside out. It will. That's exactly what sin does. And the moment you think, well, that will never happen to my family, we're tight. It's already on its way. Can you imagine living in Micah's day? He just, he, just, he just said this, there's no godly men around. He, he goes throughout all Israel looking for godly men. Good men can find none. The authorities, the, the, the leaders, the decision makers, they're corrupt. Even family members, you can, they're not even reliable because sin has just completely just torn them apart. 
He even, he even talked about even the, the, the spouses, about uh, the one that he w- would lie in his bosom. I mean, that, would, that deals with the spouse. He says, don't even talk to her because she's not even reliable. Uh, I, I mean, that's exactly what we'll sin will do. And Micah is saying this, all these helps that should be there are not reliable. All these helps, men who should be godly men, good men, they're not there. The authorities, the government, who should be helps, not reliable. Even your own family members who should be helps, they're not reliable. So where's Micah supposed to go? Hey, when all human helps have failed and are no longer reliable, Micah is to turn his attention and focus on the Lord. Think of verse 7. Micah is to turn to the one who is always reliable. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah said, therefore. This means because things are so, because there's no godly men, because even the political leaders and those who are in position are corrupt, and because even family members are corrupt, and and, and because sin has just crept in so much so, this is what he said, I'm not going to look to to society anymore. I'm not going to look to the government anymore. I'm not even going to look at my own family members anymore. My focus will be on the Lord. Hey, when you look at your Bibles, it should be all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Is it? It is, because this is what this means. It means that he is looking to Jehovah God. He is looking to the self-existent one. He is looking to the one who never changes. He is looking to the one who is an always constant figure. Hey, the government might change. Your family members might change. Your peers might change. Those around you might change. And as everything else that is around Micah is changing, Micah says this, I'm just going to look to the one who never changes. I'm going to look to the one who's self-existent. I'm going to look to the one who's self-reliant. I'm going to look to the one who doesn't depend on any person or, any, or anybody else. I'm going to look to the Lord, is what he said. Then he also said this. Now, look at your Bibles. Therefore, will I look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation. Okay, so here's the scene. Micah, he's in Israel. He's looking around, looking for anybody who's faithful. He's looking for anybody just to be there. He can't find any person and so the Bible says that he's going to look unto the Lord and then he's going to wait. Does that mean he's just going to do this? I'm waiting, Lord. I'm waiting for you. No. Hey, waiting is not sitting around doing nothing. Waiting is doing what you're supposed to be doing. Waiting is a verb. Waiting is, listen, Staying faithful with what you know that you should be staying faithful in. So, that, th- so this is what Micah is saying. The world is changing. All of Israel, there's no good men. Even the political leaders, there's no good men. Even family members, there's no good men. There, there, there's none here. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep my focus on the Lord. And as I keep my focus on the Lord, I'm going to continue to serve him where I'm at. That's what Micah is doing. Micah says there's no good, godly, reliable people in Israel. Micah says this, I will be the good, godly man in Israel. Micah says there's no faithful man in Israel. Micah says I'm going to be the faithful man in Israel. And here's the thing, Micah knows. (laughs) Micah knows he's alone. But I like what he says at the very last part of verse number 7. He says, my God will hear me. Hey, if you're the minority, don't you think it can get kind of lonely? Micah says this, my God's going to hear me. Nobody else might hear me. Nobody else might be concerned about me. Nobody else might be concerned about how I'm feeling about being the minority here. My God will hear me. You know, I, I just can't help but look at the world in which we live in and think this. It seems that our world is sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. You know, it just seems that the light of those trying to live according to righteousness is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. (laughs) I think it's no surprise if I say society is getting darker. I don't think it's no surprise if I say our government is getting darker. Hey, even 
family members aren't reliable. It's not that you don't love them anymore, but it's just that they condone sinful actions, and it's just like, well, they're not reliable anymore. Hey, all of these things are supposed to be helps for us. <laughs> they're no longer reliable. Hey, church family, I, I'm trying to be quick here because I know you worked all day, and I'm trying to, to be quick. Hey, when our sources of human helps fail us, and they're no longer reliable, may we continue to keep our attention and focus on the Lord. Yeah. It can be very discouraging to look for others to live righteously and find none. Boy, can't that be discouraging? It's like you want to find other people who have the same standards of holiness as you do. No, I understand. I I say holiness. I don't mean holier than thou. You know what I mean by that. We're mature enough in, in our faith to know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, I, I mean, you're trying to find people who love the Lord like you love the Lord. You're trying to find people who have the same standards as you in regards to sanctification. You're trying to find people to try to be an encouragement with you and try to establish some good friendships with you. But it can be very discouraging when you look out maybe in your community and you're looking out maybe out at your workplace and you find none. That can be discouraging. It can be discouraging to see peers, oh, this is discouraging, to see peers who used to stand for righteousness and drift away. To see people that you know, at one point in their their lives, they used to love the Lord like you love the Lord. They used to attend church like you attend church. They they used to be concerned uh, about sanctification. They used to be concerned about having a walk with God. They used to be concerned about all those things and then they used to be maybe even a source of counsel and comfort where you can pour your, hearts, pour your hearts to them, but then just over the course of time, you just notice that they have allowed sinfulness to come into their lives, and it's like you just look at them. It's not that you don't like them. It's not that you don't love them, but you look at their sinful lifestyle, and you just think they're not reliable anymore. That's discouraging. It would be discouraging to see churches of like faith close their doors. That's discouraging. And if they, don't close their jo- if they don't close their doors, then they change entirely. They change their doctrine. They change their stance on the Word of God. They change their position on the local church. They change their, their, their position on salvation. They change all these different things. They change their, their, uh, their doctrine and their stance on separation. They, they, they change all those things. Hey, church, let me say this. All those things that I just mentioned are supposed to be helps for us. Peers are supposed to be a help for us. Society and government are supposed to be a help for us. Hey, even churches are supposed to be a help for us. Our fellow brothers and sisters, iron supposed to sharpeneth iron. We're supposed to be a help for one another. But it can be very, very discouraging when all these things, because sin begins to creep their, its way into their lives, it just becomes very, very discouraging. So what do we do? Here's what we do. We keep our focus on the Lord. Keep your focus on the self-existent one. Keep your focus on the one who never changes. Keep your focus on the one who is everlasting. Keep your focus. Hey, let, let me remind us of something. If our God doesn't change, then his position on sin shouldn't, doesn't change. And since our God doesn't change and his position on sin doesn't change, then I would su- submit this to us here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Our position on sin shouldn't change. And since our God's position... Uh, since our God doesn't change and his word never changes, then here's the thing that I, was, that I want to promote and push this. We should never change his word because his word never changes. And since God doesn't change, then neither should we. You know, the greatest of men have fallen and drifted away, church family. Listen, as others fall, it's because of this. They fail to keep their focus on him. Listen, Godly men cease to be godly when their focus isn't on God. Did you hear that? Godly men cease to be godly when their focus isn't on God. So what does that mean for Calvary Baptist Church? Well, this is what we do. Keep our focus on God. (laughs) Pretty simple. Keep our focus on God. And as you keep your focus on the Lord, hey, we do this. We wait on the Lord. Hey, the world is constantly changing, isn't it? The world is constantly being bombarded and, and, and bombarding us to change and to adapt. It, it, hey, the world is very, very loud, isn't it? 
And as the world is so loud and the world is pressuring us to change, hey, listen, the world might change. Our peers might change. Others around us might change. Hey, even churches of like faith might change. But this is what we must do. We must always keep our focus on the Lord. And, and, and since he doesn't change, church, we should not change. We shouldn't. And, and as our focus is on him, then this is what we must also do. We must wait. Wait. Hey, remember, like I said, waiting isn't doing anything. That's not what I mean by waiting. What I mean by waiting is this. We continue to serve the Lord today just like we did yesterday. That's how we wait on the Lord. Hey, if you're actively involved in a ministry, then be faithful to that ministry. Continue to be faithful to God. Can, hey, continue to keep reading your Bible. Continue to keep coming to church. Continue to keep passing out gospel tracts. Continue to be a witness to your co-workers. Continue to just be faithful in the areas and where you, God has li allowed you to serve him. Continue to do that and wait on him. Hey, the world is constantly going to change. The world is always changing. But since the world always changes, but our God never changes, hey, let's just keep our focus on the one who's most consistent. Let's keep our focus on the one who never changes. Let's keep our focus on the one who is always reliable. Let's keep our focus on him and wait on him. And I'll be real honest with you. It's discouraging when we're the minority. It's discouraging. You see churches, they, they sacrifice so many important things in regards to their faith to build the crowds, to build the numbers. And you know, as a pastor, I look at that and think, wow, it would be great if we had those numbers. But I'm not going to sacrifice what's most important. I'm not willing to sacrifice that at all. It can get discouraging. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows it's discouraging. But I like what Micah said in the very last part of verse number 7. My God will hear me. Hey, when the world around you is changing and you're feeling lonely and your focus is on Him and you're just trying to serve the Lord the best you can, hey, the Lord hears you. Our Lord knows that we're hurting when we're hurting. Our Lord knows about our cares. Our Lord knows about our thoughts and concerns. Our God is very much aware of all of those things. So church, I want to encourage you this way. When you feel like you're all alone, keep focus. Keep your focus on the Lord. Keep waiting on the Lord. Keep doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. Keep going to church. Keep being a faithful witness to Him. And even when you're discouraged, He hears you. The fact that our God is willing to cup His ear and listen to, oh, wretched men and women that we are, the fact that He's willing to hear us should be enough. <laughs> we serve a great God. Let's keep our focus on Him and stay faithful to Him because our God is very, very faithful to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night that you've given us. Lord, I thank you, dear God, for...